This morning, we've got lots of bits and bobs to get through. We've got a little bit of Stephen Relful, who is in charge of the Lake District Summer Music Festival, who's going to take us through the programme and uh, tell us how that amazing... Um, I was just looking at the last page, Steve, of all the sponsors and help that you get towards the festival. It's an astonishing array of um, yeah. sponsors and, you know, financial support and, you know... All no, that's, that's kind. Thank you. I, I can't credit my mother for anything. She's not alive. But, you know, you know it's like it's a, you gather everything you can to, uh, to, to to support things. Yeah. So yeah. thanks so, for well, noticing that. So it's great. So so congratulations on that. I know that that kicks off in, in July, isn't it? But anyway, we'll find out much more about that shortly. Yeah. We're going to hear from Gabby, um, Gabby Lipska and Roisin McClendon uh, from a project called Story Silience, which was a collaboration involving Lakeland Arts and other organisations as well. And um, I bumped into Roisin at the last network face-to-face -face meeting at Sunbeams, Annie Mawson Sunbeams. And uh, I'm really glad that we're going to hear about that project this morning as well. And then Ellie Page from an organisation called Outside In, which some of you may have heard of, but I bet everybody hasn't heard of. I certainly hadn't heard of it. Um, there's a new hub that's been set up for the Northwest, and Ellie is the um, hub manager. So Ellie's going to tell us a bit more about Outside In and what that is all about and why it can be really uh, a really great connection for Cumbria too. And then we're also going to hear about the Fantastic Arts Artists Commission that is still live as an offer from um, the new uh, People and Places, Creative People and Places project in West Cumbria. So Sam's going to tell us about that as well. Um, and we'll also ju just update you on the training that's coming up, fundraising and also um, Something else. Oh, the survey. Hopefully everyone's filled out the survey that we've done. We've had about 90 responses already. If you haven't filled out the survey, we'll just mention that at the end. We need your help to give us data so that we can apply for money to help you with training. So we'll just mention that at the end as well. That is the plan for this morning. Feel free to bung anything into chat as ever. Um, still one or two people coming through the door. Um, but let's kick off with um, Steve. Steve Felfall, who is in charge of the Lake District Summer Music Festival. Um, and Steve, Amy is going to share the draft, final draft, I think, program that you sent through yesterday um, for you to, to talk with or through or however you want to do it. So we've got about 15 minutes for this. So, Steve, the floor is yours. OK, thanks very much, Tom. And nice to see everybody. And, and thanks, Tom and, and Katie, for inviting me to speak today. Um, the caveat is just to prove that actually what you're about to see is actually now finished and out there just in time for us to go live on Monday. Um, so Nick, my manager said, just make sure they know this isn't complete. I said, it's all right, Nick, it's calm down, we're, we're fine. Um, so, and it was lovely to be at, at uh, the Brewery Arts Centre the other week and to actually meet people and discuss and, and get to know. And just to prove that leaving a card on the table can work, if, um, if Amy, you just hit page five. Nice picture, isn't it? <laughs> can you go to, Page, you get, you're getting there. Page five, you'll see a Scottish lassie called Dame Evelyn Glennie. What's happened? Um, keep going down one more. That's that's my five. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, Drum Nation were leaving cards all over the tables, and I desperately needed somebody to do a drumming workshop uh, because I've been talking to Caroline Housley at the Cumbria Deaf Association because I wanted to do a little bit of focus about communication really um here i go start using my hands etc and you'll know about evelyn glenny who, who, who is a fantastic musician percussionist i've got to do a rehearsal with her in june so i'm i'm brushing up uh, right right now uh, anyway um we've got this this uh, this workshop in the morning that jenny Rowe is going to lead for part of, uh, from drum, drum nation leading up to the concert at night and also through caroline um that event will have a signer the evening concert will and on the Sunday when somebody's going to talk about Vienna, which is the underlying strand right through the festival, that will also be signed. So these are things I've wanted to get 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 towards a little bit, a little bit more um, for everybody to make us good listeners or good receivers. And also one day I'll learn proper sign language. Um, my wife doesn't hear very well and sometimes I think it might be useful. It saves having to do that when things are thrown across the kitchen at you, I, I, I guess. Um, so you can see the, the type of concert we have there. That's great. If you go on to six, please, Amy. Next one down. This really is, as you can see, it's a draft, but I, again, I can show you that it's, it's for real. 
the master classes were a, a, a benchmark of Lake District Soil Music. It, it actually, talking to Renna, the founder, Renna Kellaway, she said, the instigation for the festival was more like providing opportunities for students in that big summer void. Um, then in 2016, it was just breaking the bank, so it stopped. So what I've been keen to do is get students not just to come in for a class and go out, but actually be with us for longer. So you can, they can really build up throughout the week um, and they can build their journey. And we start to lock into them and help their careers, hopefully burgeon and flourish throughout, you know, the next few important years of getting into the career. So that, that flash on there will show you most of what the classes are that, that are public. There are other private ones as well. But what I wanted to do very much is actually give the students not, not just a chance to do a debut, but also play alongside their mentors. So um, in a concert we'll come to on Wednesday night with the Sacconi Quartet and a rather fabulous musician called Gwilym Simcock, who is a bit hard to define. Um, but I, I knew him as a young boy, as playing French horn and piano and composing a bit. And he's, he's just exceptional. Um, but some of the pieces we'll do, we'll have the two student quartets playing alongside Gwilym and the Sakonis plus a bass player. So that gives you an idea about that. But that area of building the student offer is something I've got big plans to try and develop in the next two or three years. So there's about 13 students involved this year. I'd like that to be about 20 next year. And then also, uh, as we a lot of us talked about the brewery arts, it would be great to engage local students in other ways about production, marketing, et cetera. So, but that's, that gives you the idea of what the public will see. And I know the public like to, to get to know these young artists on the way up, um, which I think is great. So if they can meet them, chat to them, et cetera. And, and, and one thing I'm, I'm keen to do as well, um, and just listening to the pre-meeting chat, I've just realized how much I don't know about what's going on in different art forms, but I'd love to say, get a quartet who trains with us for a week. And then in the following week, they play in one of the usual venues for us, but then go out and about to some of the smaller venues. Great experience for them and great for, for, for us to, you know, just stick them in the money bus and, and, and what have it. Um, so if it's, if it's for four, four people and a dog, it's, it's got its value. Um, but that's that's something I'd, I'd love to to investigate more, and I'm, I'm sure people on this meeting could tell me more about it. Okay, I'll keep going swiftly. Page seven, please, Amy. Um, yeah, I mentioned the uh, the kind of Viennese strand. In a way, for a musician and for artists and and what have you, it's an easy one. I, I love secession art, Gustav Mahler, all that that kind of period. I love, but. You can't do a whole festival around that, or you overdose on glue vine or something. Um, but it, it gives me the opportunity to put in some major works by some terrific artists. This quartet, the Barbican Quartet, are just fabulous. I saw them, I saw them about three years ago in the same week. I saw, shall I say, a very long-standing quartet, and they were they wiped them off the off the playing field, you know. So I'm very delighted they're coming. Um, so that's a bit of that. Further down that page, maybe it's page eight, in fact, Amy. Yeah, it is. A, a few more of the, you just start to see some of the family things that, that I wanted to do in the first year, and they're continuing now. So three events back at the jetty. I'm keen to work with all of you in the venues, etc. So we've got um, we've got three three performances at the concertinis there, which is harp and colours, etc. You, you can read the blurb along the way. Um, Alex Jacob uh, Whitworth did a workshop for us last year. She filled in for James Mayhew, who had the COVID. Um, but she's we're going to do she's going to do more like puppet making this time, using a little known piece called Peter and the Wolf. Um, but it opens up many channels by which to um, to explore. And then the songs from our sea, shores and sea. Um, if you know about Lizzie Ball, you'll know what a versatile artist she she is. And working with someone like Gabby Swallow, who's who's the go-to cellist. She's just been around Australia and New Zealand with Rob Brydon and all these sorts of things. But this is one of two projects, if you like, that, that we're doing this year. The first one I'll tell you about very briefly, you won't see in this brochure. Um, but in two weeks' time, one of the groups that's coming from the RNCM to give a concert for patrons 
I want to build in more connections. So the, the following day, they're doing workshops in two schools, uh, Furnace Academy and Roos Primary School, or is it Roos? I never get it right. Um, and then in that evening, we're going to go to the Westman Youth Orchestra and, and do an informal session with them. The following day, we've got a string players day. Come and play, get your violin out of the cupboard, come and join us, and the quartet will be involved in that. So it's like a three-day three day program for them, but it's, it's trying to, to connect a bit more and offering something that doesn't always bob up. So that's one thing. This, this one, the, this, the Songs from Seas and Shores, um, there's a folk uh, musician called Martin Purdy. Some of you may know Martin. Um, who's, who's formed a duo with a, with a friend of mine, actually, a bass player. These two are going to do a little mini tour. This is on the Thursday. You'll see it along the way. It is related, folks. I'll get there. <laughs> um, but they're going to do a mini tour starting in Kirby Lonsdale because through a friend of mine, he's on the committee at the Save Ruskin's View. And he said, Steve, is there anything we can do to raise a bit of profile, a bit of money, etc.? So. These two guys will do Kirby Lonsdale, Sizer Castle, Grange, and Rydal Mount. Um, they're just going to pop up and play. And if you put money in the bucket, that will help towards the, the funding for Save Ruskin's View. But it also gives chance for us to put Ruskin's View in the brochure. People can see the link. you just got to kick up the dust, haven't you, to try and make these things uh, expand. So that's that one. <laughs> Sorry, I've drifted away from songs from our shores and sea. But this is this is talking with um, with Daniel and as and as Helen knows very well, post our chat the other day, this will be the end of our Martin Purdy is going to go into three schools and do folk song workshops. The, the ideal would be to create a new folk song based around Barrow and the history of etc. Um, but whatever comes or goes on that final day as part of placation, this is on the Friday and um, these three fabulous musicians will be there working with the children who've either already worked with us in the schools or have just arrived on the day and want to join in. Um, so it'd be a real creative day. And then there'll be a performance about three o'clock and run through the songs, etc. And, you know, Lizzie, Gabby and Milos, they've all got different backgrounds and they can bring a lot of colour to that. You'll see them in their classical kicks concert in Kendall the next day. But that is a kind of swift me chattering away guide to the, the kind of workshop things that have a, a point and a purpose which I'm, I'm very keen to develop. Next slide please as they say. Um, that's that's all right well more musical Vienna that's fine fabulous sextets next page please. Yeah um, you'll see you'll know about Steve Watts some of you Steve did a, a walk for us in the last two years, I think. Anyway, uh, uh, this is one of two walks happening this, this year. This is to try and get a bit of focus in Grasmere that day. So Steve will do the walk around there and he'll drop people off in time to he hear Jack Hanscher, who's a fabulous artist, uh, you know, lovely, lovely cultured guy. And as, as per last year, the bribe is, if you go on the walk, you get a free piece of gingerbread provided by yours truly. Um, it worked out last year and there was just enough left over for all the team to steal them all really I think basically um, so you'll see next to Jack you can just see a little coloured picture so you'll see that they, the puppet workshop is, is also in Grasmere so something for all the family part of the family, some of the family lose the kids for an hour etc and then Guy, Guy is there Guy Johnson is playing the Beethoven Sonatas which is you know pure Vienna if you like but I've got him to intersperse other bits of juicy bits of uh, juicy flavours of Vienna. And uh, by the time this concert arrives, two cellists and the pianist will have arrived. They're going to work with Guy over the next three days. They get their performance and they play a lovely piece. You won't know Popper Requiem. It doesn't tell you anything about the piece, but it's for three cellos on piano. And it's gorgeous. You know, when Classic FM find it, it'll never be off the airwaves. Um, but that's that one. How are we doing, Tom? I'm doing as good as fast as I can. Next page, please. I'll give you another four minutes, Steve. OK, I'm going fast. Side by side. This is something I did in the first year. I put this on so that people can come and play. We've got a fabulous harpist, Louise, who's playing in, in Hawkshead later that day. So you can come and join in with us that morning and have a great time. Last couple of years, I've suddenly 
taking everybody outside into uh, into the courtyard of Hawkshead and we've had a great time. Next slide, please. Okay, well, Gwilym, I've mentioned, I've kind of mentioned that. I, I would recommend this late night concert. If you've never come across his music, um, just, just look him up on Google and just go for Grieg Piano Concerto. He does a slow movement on his own like nobody else. He, he's a wonderful, uh, wonderful guy. And there's a fabulous quartet beforehand. Next one, please. Good. Well, Brantwood, um, I did last year, we did all the Bach solo violin sonatas. Uh, and this year we've got this fabulous fiddle player. And it really is Bach inspired the program. There were things I didn't know and I looked them up and of course, you know, taking a theme of Bach or whatever. Um, but we've managed to again, get a good package. So you can park the car in Coniston. You can do both concerts and have a tour of the house, get some lunch, whatever, or just one concert wherever it is, but it's a nice, it's, it's a really nice, uh, a really nice event. And I'm glad that we're doing something with an organization called the National Trust. Um, Mithras Trio, a fabulous two, of course, you wouldn't expect me to say anything else. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, well, there, there you go. I've talked to you about this collaboration with the Sikonis and Gwilym. He wrote a great piece called Cumbria Thor, Cumbrian Thor, which I did with him a few years ago. Um, the children's corner, let me use it as an example. If you know any Debussy at all, you tend to know the piano suite called Children's Corner. Um, you'll recognize it, but then Gwilym goes off on one. And then you just have to keep your wits about you and he'll bring you back into it. And it's, and it's great. It's a great blend. It's never the same twice. Um, and he's going to write something for us to round off that show. Next one. Oh, yes, next one. We're okay. Yeah, Sonic Watt, you may know Frederick Holm. He's the guy who runs uh, Westmoreland Youth Orchestra. Lovely guy. And he told me about these walks he does around, around uh, Kirby Lonsdale, for example. So he's going to meet and greet people. He'll probably play the bassoon so you know the guy you're looking for to welcome everybody. But he's going to go around the town and uh, get you to listen to the town as well as see it, which sounds fascinating. Next to that is the Apple Cellars, the tour I've mentioned to you. And then uh, a lovely trio who's just won another prize, Paddington Trio. That's all in Kirby Lonsdale, um, deliberately on market day, of course. And very grateful for Paul at the Charter Market for being so helpful and obliging and providing power. Um, in the evening, you can see at six o'clock, those of you two cellists getting their showcase. You'll see the girl on the right was a BBC Young Musician finalist, which I didn't know until the photograph came, but there you go. Next slide. <laughs> We're nearly there, folks. Hang in there. Beethoven Sonatas, part two. The Chiaro Scuro, Darkness and Light Quartet, they're one of the most sought after quartets. And I'm delighted we've got them, but it's taken two years. Uh, that's going to be a, a super concert. Again, dripping with Viennese music. But, um, you know, as I say, one not to miss. And then if we go on to the next page. Great. So that's Kendall Town Hall. We do a few concerts in Kendall this time. That's the debut concert for both the quartets. Once from Birmingham Conservatoire, once from the Royal Academy. I like to try and engage as many of the conservatoires to begin with. And then classical kicks. If you just glance a little bit, you know, from Liba Tango to Piazzolla to Hungarian dances, Lizzie's a fabulous singer as well. You know, she's always at Ronnie Scott's um, and she's just a lovely, lovely lady. Um, uh, and Gabby I've known for years as well. Super, super. That's her own hair as well. Next one. Gosh, we're there. There you go. Um, the finale is a concert I kind of wanted to do in the way it kind of kick-started my thinking. In about 1918, that sort of period, Arnold Schoenberg, uh, Anton Zemlinski, they set up a club whereby they could perform new works. Um, and one thing about their badge was Critics were not allowed. Um, applause was not allowed. You just basically heard the music. So you could imagine it's one of those forums where you play for each other. So the music on there is just sensational music, I think, but it's all in small format. So Mahler's Fourth Symphony, for example, would normally be an orchestra of about 80. This is done with 13 players and the usual singer. Uh, it was a lovely, lovely singer. And then I found out that um, Brett Dean, who's one of the leading Australian composers, had arranged Flay the Mouse Overshore, you know, which was, uh, yeah. I, I had a little little women wish to play the Tom and Jerry cartoon behind it, but I think I'll leave it there. 
So that's that's that. The rest of the rest of it is is all guffy off. That's an amazing selection, that. Steve. And I love how you're getting across different venues. Just quickly, um, Sue, I know Sue Allen has just done an interview with a chap who we've had on here before, who runs a new classical, um, relatively new classical organisation in Barrow. What's his name again, Sue? Riff Wadkin. Have you made connection with him, Steve? Say the name again, please, Sue. Griff Wadkin. He has a master's from the Birmingham Conservatoire. He's a cellist. And he uh, has played in a chamber orchestra in, in the Midlands. I've forgotten its name. He's living on Walney Island at the moment with his partner, Ling, who's a pianist. And he's running a series of concerts at St Mary's Church in Barrow. He does outreach oh, yeah. schools. And he's got a little festival, 12th to the 14th, just the first little one in August um, at the church in Barrow. But, you know, he's doing a lot of the outreach stuff as well in that area. You really should talk to him. He's off to China to teach in September, but he's going to be back every summer to he'll be programming this mini festival. So he would be around, wow. say, summer next year. Well, it's yeah, just good to know some... because I think, go on, Tom. No, I'd say just be good some, for someone for you to know about, Steve, that's all. Well, if, if <laughs> Steve, if you put your email in chat, I'll swap with you Griff's email. Yeah, it's good because the thing I'm also very keen to do is make sure that through collaboration, you don't, you don't clash with everybody. Yeah. I mean, our festival went back to nine days, and if I push it out to, to a bit longer, then mm. we're going to start to run over each other. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but at least I'm a cellist as well, so we. we oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, you yeah. need to know about Griff. He's, Re he's really nice, uh, really nice bloke, Steve. Really lovely it's, guy, young it's guy. It's interesting. His name's not come up with with anybody uh, thus far because he's, there's a furnace. He's crap at marketing himself. <laughs> okay. On that bombshell, uh, we'll move <laughs> on. Um, but That's anyway, Steve, Steve, I can't wait to come. As you know, I've not been to anything. Of these festivals before so now that i know about it a bit more i'm gonna seek out the program and obviously i guess it'll be on the website and uh yeah um, i aim to come to some stuff because it looks brilliant do, do that tom and keep in touch about it as i say it will yeah. go live for tickets and, and i'm on the website on monday patrons get first dibs like most things but i think it's for about a couple of weeks so uh yeah thanks thanks for your comments as well yeah. that's my email address gone up there and yeah any thoughts you have fire away Okay, thank you very Thanks. much, Steve. Nice to see Thanks. you. Do stick around. We're going to. I will do, now. Tom. Thank you. Yeah, going to cross now to Ellie, Ellie Page, um, who is going to tell us about Outside In, and we've got some slides to share for this as well. Um, um, Ellie and I had a chat, and I found out a bit more about Outside In, and it just sounded like a really interesting organisation, which is now blossoming a bit more in the northwest. And when we say northwest, we don't just mean the urban northwest. So, Ellie, mm -hmm. I'm going to hand over to you, and Amy will get your slides up, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I realised when I was looking through the slides this morning that one of them I accidentally dragged to a bit further down, so at some point there'll be a bit of a swap. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, next slide please. Um, so yeah, I'm Ellie. I'm managing the Northwest Hub for Outside In. Um, I'm a self-taught disabled artist myself. Um, my background is in youth and social work um, and adult mental health. Um, and then when my mobility worsened um, is when I started making art kind of therapeutically. And that's how I sort of segued myself into the arts world. Um, so I'm still a freelance producer, curator and access consultant, um, as well as managing the hub. So next slide. So um, <clears throat> basically just going to go through a little bit about Outside In, um, a bit of context to the Northwest Hub. Um, examples of how we work with artists and examples of how we work with organisations. Um, it can be quite difficult sometimes to explain in one sentence what Outside In does. Um, so just to sort of a couple of things as a caveat. One is that I often find it easiest to describe us as like a bridge. So just think of a bridge throughout the rest, basically. Um, and <clears throat> the other caveat is that um, I am only two and a half days a week at the moment. We're in a bit of a limbo period. So the Northwest Hub is here. There are lots of things I want to do, um, but you know, I just want to make you aware that there is a slight lack of like events programmed over the next few months because we're waiting on a funding thing that we should find out about in about July. 
So at the moment, I'm mostly sort of talking to and connecting with organisations and artists, um, but it is in that sort of funding limbo bit slightly at the moment. Next slide, please. So Outside In is a, a visual arts organisation um, who our aim is to provide a platform for artists to encounter significant barriers to the arts world, which is a very broad category. Um, <clears throat> but this could be through mental or physical health, disability, social circumstance, isolation. Um, by social circumstance, mean things like, um, you know, experiences of the criminal justice system, experiences of traveling here as a refugee, things like that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so it started as a side project at Pallant House Gallery in 2006 um, and became an in independent charity in 2017 and has been an NPO since 2018. So we're actually still quite young as an organisation, um, but with grand ambitions as, as most charities, I think. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, just to give you a bit of background. So um, the hub was started as sort of a project funded pilot programme um, hosted by Venture Arts in partnership with Outside In and the Whitworth Art Gallery. Uh, Venture Arts is a supported studio for learning disabled artists uh, based in Hume. Um, the aim for the project was to kind of let people know about Outside In. Um, and I think the target to sign up artists and help them to create an online gallery. Um, I'll, show, I'll talk a bit more about what Outside In does in a minute, um, was about 40 artists. And within about nine months, we'd reached over 75. Um, and I mentioned that just because I think it shows that there's a real need for what it is that we're doing. Um, and also as part of that limited project. So unfortunately, these opportunities aren't yet available this year, but we're able to design and deliver 10 bespoke artist residencies for learning disabled and neurodiverse artists, which was just fantastic. Um, and we had an exhibition to showcase their work um, at the end of the year. Next slide, please. Um, that's a badly placed photo of the exhibition from the residency artists. Um, so how we support artists is basically three kind of strands. So there's artist development. Um, we have a training program and uh, ambassadors who are volunteer, who are artists who go and represent us at various locations and things and exhibitions. So we are primarily a digital platform. So artists can go onto our website and create an online gallery. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please. So we host artist support days. So did one in person at the Blue Coat in Liverpool quite recently, um, but these are also regularly done online. So at an artist support day, um, people can book in for an hour uh, with me or one of the facilitator artists. And we can do things like take high quality photographs of someone's work. Um, it can just be used as a general one-to-one -one kind of career mentoring service. Um, we can write an artist statement, look at access riders. Um, you know, I could help you to write a funding bid, things like that. It's basically some one-to-one -one time, um, yeah, to just try and see if there's any way, see what someone wants and if there's any way that we can help. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that's a photo of part of one of the residencies where we got a behind the scenes tour of Manchester Museum's vivarium and got to hold lots of frogs and lizards and it was very fabulous. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess this was part of the caveat is just to, because I still get emails sometimes saying, oh, are these residencies still available? And it's really sad that they're not because it was really great. Um, so yeah, it is things like residencies and project opportunities are yeah subject to availability and depending on what you know, partner organisation projects have got going on and things like that. But what I have been able to do, even in this kind of limbo period, is because I work closely with all of the artists who sign up, because it is just me here in the Northwest. So I do know everyone that I've been working with. I always um, I'm able to bear them in mind. And a lot of the partner organisations get in touch with me specifically asking for specific things. So they might be like, do you know any artists who have an interest in climate change and live in this area because we've got this project coming up and it's paid, et cetera, et cetera. 
and I'm able to be like, yes, this person and put you in touch. So still been able to get lots of opportunities for people, even in this kind of limbo period where I've not been able to program much activity myself. Next slide, please. Um, we also host something called Share Arts events. Um, so these are online or in person and they're kind of like a soft crit group, which so it's a it's an opportunity. There's, there's one to one support in advance, but it's an opportunity for artists to talk about their art um, and their practice, but in a kind of welcoming and safe environment. So the audience is usually other outside in artists um, or friends or family. So they can be in person um, or online. Um, and they've been really good and it's they're great to attend actually if you see any on the website because it's just lovely to hear about people's artwork and stories and their practice um next slide please so the step up training program is i think maybe one of the most um unique like offers that we have that supports artists um there are four types of courses exploring collections talking about art curating exhibitions and leading workshops. Um, so that photo is the Sculpture Conservator at uh, the Whitworth Gallery showing us a Judith Scott piece as part of, um, if you go to the next slide actually, yeah. Yeah, as part of a course, an Exploring Collections course we just did at the Whitworth called the Musgrave Kinley, uh, where we looked at the Musgrave Kinley Outsider Art Collection, which is the UK's biggest collection of outsider art. Uh, so yeah these are 10 weeks and the aim is to kind of explore research skills um and also for the artist to make to create an art artistic response to the artist that they've chosen to research um next slide please so yeah that's um some of the work that we did with the musgrave kinley collection this year so we've got a private sharing event at the whitworth in early june um and it was brilliant and i mean we had four full sessions with all of the curators at the Whitworth with objects from the collection out in the study centre, looking at them and researching them. And it was really great. Next slide, please. That's just a quote by a participant. There are no words to describe what this opportunity has done for my self-confidence and my practice. It has been invaluable. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, curating exhibitions. So that's a six week course. And yeah, it's obviously about curating exhibitions. So there'll be lots of guest speakers with experiences in different types of curation. Um, and there's some examples of previous um, museums and galleries that we've done, we've done that course with. Next one, please. Uh, leading workshops does what it says on the tin. It's about facilitating workshops, but it's a lot about the practical skills. So, you know, for artists who haven't quite broken that barrier of um, you know, working freelance to do things like deliver workshops and do project work. So we'll go through all the practical things like invoicing, risk assessments, um, you know, how to plan a workshop, dealing with behaviour, things like that. Um, yeah, next, next one, please. We have ambassadors. So really annoyingly, by the time I'd sent this PowerPoint over, the video hadn't been uploaded, but the ambassadors are yeah, artists who um, volunteer to like speak about their experience with Outside In and things at various events. Um, but we just won the Queen's Award or King's Award. I don't know if they're renaming it. I presume so. King's Award for voluntary service last year. Uh, and on Tuesday, two of our ambassadors were at Buckingham Palace. And there's a very lovely video of them all dressed up with a fancy hat and being very chuffed. Um, so do have a look on the social media for that because it's a lovely video. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so exhibitions is the other strand. Again, that's kind of subject to what's going on with other organisations. So what I've been doing in the meantime, while I've not been able to programme the things myself while we're in the, the two and a half day limbo phase, um, is I've been making sure that I put artists in touch with um, private galleries who would be like interested in selling that type of artwork. Um, and that's that kind of bridge thing. That's what I'm trying to just be at the moment. Well, I can't program things, trying to make sure that people know about opportunities. Um, but obviously we also support artists to apply for external ex exhibitions and things like that. We've also got a virtual gallery and a virtual museum, which the programme of which we're like developing at the moment. Um, and this is where the slide that needs to come next, I accidentally moved further down, but um, 
so yeah we'll come back to that actually but uh sorry working sorry my brain's got I have narcolepsy and sometimes my brain goes a bit funny yeah thank you um so I'll come back to our national exhibition because the slide is a bit later um so how we might work with organizations is yeah networking artist support working with collections so all of those step up training courses you know they all rely on um a really good relationship with a partner organization um whether it's access to the collection or you know support talks with some of the artists who are working with galleries at the moment um next slide please yeah so for venues the type of thing that would you know would be helpful as part of our partnership would be sort of offering space for us to host an artist support day um we might connect organizations with artists um sometimes organized like galleries and cultural institutions fund various projects will require them to work with people who meet certain criteria so often we can put people in touch um, and recommend people for projects and then with community groups i'll often do like artist support day specifically to that community group so I'll go to the group for the day um, and everyone who attends will have a slot and we'll photograph the artwork and upload it and it's basically about elevating people's profile and kind of sense of themselves as an artist um, and yeah I mentioned about working with collections and the exhibition opportunities um, so yeah if you could go to the next slide so those are some of the main partners that we've been working with over the last year um who have all been wonderful next one please yes so this is the slide that was meant to come after the exhibitions one every two years um outside in has an open call national exhibition we've just had this year's one which was on the theme of humanity so it was hosted at sotheby's in london um and you can see from the pictures the exhibition itself was just wonderful and it was also just very glamorous and gorgeous <laughs> um so every year there's one main hosting organized hosting gallery this year it was Sotheby's and then the exhibition will tour to two other venues so it, this year it's going to be in projectability in Glasgow in August and Brighton and Hove Museums in January um at the preview night of sort of the first venue there's always a celebrity guest judge so at the previous one it was Grayson Perry this year it was Bob and Roberta Smith and so they'll choose their favourite and then I think two runners up and the prize for the favourite is um, a solo touring exhibition the following year um, at various locations nationally. Um, Just another 30 seconds Ellie, I think you're almost done aren't you? Yeah I'm done pretty much, yeah next slide please. Um, and yeah why I'm here today at the Cumbria Arts and Culture Network is just uh, I really want to work across Cumbria my mobility is bad, I can't drive. Um, thankfully, one of the artists is driving me around. So I think some of you have probably already had an email from me about a trip um, that I'm doing in June where I'm hoping to try and meet as many of you as possible. Um, and yeah, I'm aware that things that claim to represent the Northwest often just mean Manchester and Liverpool and places near those cities. Next slide, please. And yeah, those are the dates for the trip. Um, so. If you'd like to meet and I haven't been in touch with you, please do get in touch. Um, it's also possible I'm about to get in touch with you anyway. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. Thank you. Whistle stop. Whistle stop tour. That's great, Ellie. Thank you so much. And can you put your contact into chat? There's some really nice comments that you need to pick up in chat as well. Um, people are really appreciating you telling us about um, Outside In. Um, it feels like it's a real collaborative opportunity as well. Yeah. Your, your organisation working with, with either artists or organisations across Cumbria yeah um, and i didn't realize you know the, the spread and the ambition of what you've achieved already as an organization is amazing yeah. um and uh i hope you get to beyond two and a half days <laughs> sounds like you've so got do I, thank you <laughs> all right so um please do put your contacts into chat and thank you for letting us know about it and let's keep in touch and do you know do feel free to send me stuff that i can spread around the network um for other projects that you're doing thanks ellie lovely to lovely to meet you um, right, we're now gonna we're gonna hear about um, uh, the story Silience project now from Gabby and from Rasheen who worked together on this, um, and um, it's a really interesting story. So I'm gonna give you the floor. I don't know who's gonna start, Gabby and Rasheen. 
And again, Amy, who's working very hard this morning, is going to share. I think we've got about 10 slides or so with this one as well. So over to you. OK, thank you, Tom. Um, and hello, everyone. Thank you for having us today. Um, really happy to be here with Roisin. Um, I'll start briefly talking about, about uh, CDEC, who we are, about the project. And then actually we, what we wanted to do, our aim today is to share our learning from the project and the resources that we have generated, because we think that might be, uh, that might be useful. Um, so my name is Gabby and I work for Cumbria Development Education Centre, which is a local charity uh, that has been here in Cumbria for decades. Uh, maybe a bit unlikely actor today because we are not a creative um, organization at, as such. We are educators and experimenters uh, looking at innovation in education. But this project was, um, um, was uh, we were entering collaboration with creative sector. Uh, so CIDEC is a, we are, at CIDEC, we are pioneers of dialogic learning and uh, participatory leadership. Um, we focus on social and environmental justice, multiculturalism, uh, well-being, global citizenship, and generally looking into learning and unlearning. Um, and uh, there are two strands to our work. One is working with formal and informal education sector, and the other one is community work. The Store Resilience Project um, uh, is a, was one of our uh, international projects uh, funded by Erasmus. Uh, led by CDEC uh, in Cumbria, Global Learning London uh, from London and two international partners, uh, them from Turkey and Povod from Slovenia. And uh, our intention was to deal with the psychological aftermath of COVID and, uh, and the impact it had on young people. And especially as we work very closely with schools and teachers in Cumbria, we knew well that the well-being um, of students was not really um, there was not enough space to take care of that. When school was back, it was about all about getting back to work and getting the grades and uh, learning uh, back on track. Um, so that was the, the purpose of this project was to really fill in that void and see what healing needs to be done. And for this, uh, using uh, creative arts and, uh, and as I said, trying and innovating, um, using very well-grounded you know, research in psychology and education um blending blending methodologies that all four partners have each of us each of the international partners had paired up with a local creative organization so here in uh, cumbria we've worked with a uh, theater factory that i believe is also part of this of this network and with like and with roshin from lakeland arts and i think that the collaborate particular collaboration with roshin and the chemistry we've had between the two of us have allowed us to really experiment and really go far with this project um, so this is what we would like to uh, we would like to share today. So if we can have the second slide, please. Thank you. So the as I said, uh, project well grounded in uh, research in psychology. What we've looked at as our framework was the seven C's of resilience, which is a concept um, um, created by um, American pediatrician um, who works with uh, with uh, young people. Uh, Mr. Ginsberg. So we were looking at, through this project, we were looking at, in particular, at confidence, control, character, coping, competence, and connection and contribution. So elements which are crucial for, for creating resilient, people, resilient uh, humans and really improving well-being. And uh, project-centered collabor collaboration and cooperation with young people, uh, really working from a place of authentic authenticity, uh, showing up, being together, Following a little bit of what CDEC is doing, um, the idea that we first need to connect with ourselves, have a better understanding of and self-awareness of ourselves, then we can connect with other people, and then we can connect with the wider world, with the planet, and that it's all very much interlinked. Uh, so I'll pass on to uh, Roisin, who can tell a bit more from, from her perspective as a performing arts practitioner, how the what, what we have learned and uncovered as part of the as part of the process, and I can talk a little bit more about some tools and structures we've used as well, and then and then present the, the resources that we have. Thank you, Gabby, and hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. And um, so, yeah, as Gabby said, I'm Roisin, and I work with young people to cultivate confidence really in their creative uh, expression. And I've got a wide range of experience co-creating programs with young people in my current work at Lakeland Arts, but also previously as a youth worker. So I'm going to today just unpack this idea of co-creation, which was something that was central to story resilience. It's a buzzword that gets 
thrown around a lot at the moment. And um, so we're going to unpack how we tackled this in quite a genuine way, I feel. And um, so I don't know if we need the next slide, Amy. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is the kids. Um, so the first strand of co-creation for us is facilitating an authentic group dynamic. And what I mean by this is helping each participant to show up as themselves and interact with each other without feeling a need to hide or to wear a mask in order to fit in. Um, now we all try to attune to the tribe, but teenagers especially become skilled at hiding themselves within their day-to-day -day interactions. So when you're in a participatory space, this kind of chameleonizing needs to really be disrupted so that you can allow the young person to you know, show up authentically. So one way that this disruption was signaled, can I have the next slide, please, Amy? Yeah, if you keep going, another one, um, is through an active rejection of hierarchy within the space that we created. So from the outset, we asked for a mutual responsibility within the group um, and for each of us to respect and care for one another alongside ourselves. So it's about participants stepping up, which is an opportunity that they are more than capable of taking, but are often not afforded. Um, but it's equally about facilitators stepping away from any temptations to kind of lead from the top down. So you must be able to give up a sense of authority that you want to have in the room and instead see the participants as the rightful guides of your work. Can I have the next slide, please, Amy? Um, so you're about to see a visual, hopefully, if, if the slide changes, um, which I think illustrates the disruption of hierarchy that we achieved in the room quite well. So this is me on the floor in the rehearsal room. Um, and I remember laying down consciously as a signal that if my input was not wanted at that time or respected, that I wouldn't force it upon anyone. Um, we agreed that everyone could enter the space, whatever the mood or energy level was. So as an equal participant, um, this was my way of showing up authentically in that moment. And by the way, letting them know that they can show up imperfectly too. Um, and obviously, because we were creating a physical theatre piece, this had an enhanced effect of telling a story through an image made with the body. I didn't have to communicate a word at this moment because um, they knew exactly what I was trying to say. So if we could have the next slide, please, Amy, um, which, as you can see here, they were intrigued enough by what I was doing and re acknowledged their responsibility in this space and settled down themselves down ready for the next task. Um, now, this isn't something that I planned, or I would say is always appropriate, but it's about understanding the participants that you're working with to inform how you can communicate best. Um, and one of the ways that we understood our group really well, I think Gabby will back me up on this, is to create this experimental learning space. The first phase of our process was entirely dedicated to experimentation, um, which it allows for that co-creation so instead of reaching for an understanding of the group or reaching for a way forward with the project we just received it by letting go of that control experimenting with different activities and tasks and then really listening to how the group responded um so you know and listening in subtle ways so subtle shifts of the body you know if they feel uncomfortable if they're laughing as soon as you sit down quietly these are all you know real gold dust in a participatory space they allow you to um understand the patterns of engaging and select the right tasks going forward um and also what it does is it allows the participants to feel seen and understood when they're reflected themselves are reflected back to them through the tasks that you select, which builds trust between you. And it means that when you are trying to stretch those comfort zones, they know that you've considered them as an individual and they're more likely to comply with you because they've got that trust. Um, I'm just aware on time, so I'm gonna just speed through a few things. Um, but I think co-creation isn't just about doing what the group enjoy. Um, it's knowing who you're working with um, and step by step stretching those comfort zones, like I said. When we are evaluating projects for their impact, confidence is one of those kind of buzzwords like co creation that can feel a bit immeasurable. But for us, we watch this group step by step just grow in connection and confidence week upon week as they saw themselves reflected in the work and, and being honoured in the work. Um, so it's just about how you document that process. 
Um, and we've received such positive feedback from participants and families and teachers. And what's really encouraging is that the Arts Council strategy that I know a lot of us work towards is about building this confidence in the creative expression of our communities to the extent that I would say when we're applying for funding, we can state that this process is the outcome itself. Um, you know, the, the final performance isn't a product of creative genius. It's more a celebration of the growth that's already taken place. Um, so yeah, to make this happen, I would say, I would go as far as to say that the relationships that you build with participants, the bond of trust, that consensus of responsibility and genuine equality in the group that I've talked about, that relationship is um, the work itself. Uh, and Gabby is going to, I'm going to pass back over to Gabby, who can talk more about the tools now. Okay, so one of the tools that we've been using, because parallel to creative work and the process that Roshin has been describing, we were really intentional about um, supporting young people in their understanding of their internal press processes and their own well well-being and what's happening on their emotional uh, level. So they are they are becoming more literate uh, with that. So one of the tools we've been using was practice of circling uh, together. And if we can have another slide, please. And one more, this one, yeah. So uh, that's, as you can see, it's a model of, uh, you know, working in a circle and it's it's it's, it's a loop. Uh, we, we come back to it. And um, so we're always start, starting with a, um, starting and finishing. It was built with a circle. It was built into the process that, uh, that we had every week. We've met for six, I think it was six months that we have worked with young people on a weekly basis um, before they set off to Turkey to meet other young people and before they had their final performance. As you can see, this is, this is the cycle that we were going through, uh, blended with a bit of mindfulness work that we found that was necessary. Actually, we were really trying to be responsive and tuned into young people, their energy level, also their, how, how they are on a day what is going, being really, really listening to what is going on in their lives and offering space that is gentle and kind and um, that allows them to really open up and show up authentically. And as we were moving along um, um, in, a, in a process, in a project, we could see how it's, how it's growing, how their confidence is growing. And the, the guy that you saw with, uh, with Roshin on a photo, I think that's, what, that's, that, that's just amazing. You know, the, the young people from, moved from, our, from kids who were hardly speaking. They, had, they were really struggling with, with connections with other peers in school. They had quite a lot happening on the individual level in their lives. They moved on to another creative project, and the guy that was on the photos, he's even uh, he's going now to London to present on a uh, his uh, like pre poetry um, event. Uh, so he has he has really really grown uh, as a person, which is for us para paramount to the creative um, uh, to the creative element uh, that was um, unleashed and the potential that they unleashed throughout the project. So I don't know how you are with QR codes, because um, I would I will not be presenting the whole Padlet. This is an online resource where we are having our all the resources that were created by part in this partnership by, by the international partners. Each of us have uh, have um, expertise in an area of education. So there is experiential learning, there is liberation pedagogy uh, by Paulo Freire at work, multicultural learning, biologic learning that has been fed together with the observations and the practice uh, from people like Roshin. Uh, so the, 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 online, the online resource has toolkit for practitioners with activities that allow for that process to happen. It has online modules on resilience and also other methods of work that have been used throughout the project and samples of young people's work and their stories of how they, you know, what COVID has been for them like through the, and how they manage, how they grow and how they, how they've been developing over okay. that. Wow, well, that was a whistle stop tour. I know it was Gabby and Rushing. Thank you though for sharing your, your work Thank with you. us. And I know there's a few comments in chat that you might want to pick up. People want to get, that want to get in contact with you as well. Um, and and that that notion of collaboration and how you get people to be authentic is fascinating. And that little toolkit that you shared at the end there, Gabby, as well. Um, thank you for for sharing. And, you know, part part of the purpose of these calls is just to put 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 people out there so that we can we know of the existence of different organisations and different work that's going on. So hopefully um, that's been achieved this morning with that. Thank you so much for 
putting that presentation together. Really interesting, really, really interesting. Um, right, before we finish, I just want to introduce you to Sam Hunt, if you don't know him. Uh, Sam is reading, is leading the, joint leading the Creative People in Places project that started in West Cumbria. Um, I just want to give him the chance just to mention the artist commission that is still on offer at the moment. Sam, over to you. Thank you very much and thanks for squeezing me in. Hi everybody, um, yeah I'm Sam, I'm the co-director of We Are Here, which is a Creative People and Places project in West Cumbria. Very, very quickly, I've put the link in, um, in the chat there, we have a commission out um, which is um, looking for, I think, a, a group of individuals or organisations to come together and help us celebrate everyday kindness in West Cumbria. The commission's quite chunky, it's about £30,000 and we see this as the first of a program of work so I think it would be something that we'll be continuing throughout the um, life cycle of the creative people and places program um, before we go into um, our next phase of work which will be announcing a um, citizens assembly um, across West Cumbria to define what we should be doing um, so we'll be, that's um, something we'll be announcing further down the line so please have a look at the link and share the link and I really want to focus this on Cumbrian creatives, if possible, but we might go a bit wider. It closes on the 22nd of May. Um, so have a look um, and drop me a note if you have any questions at all. Get involved. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. That's great to hear about. And as I say, uh, 22nd of May, so still a little bit of time to give it some thought or share it. Uh, before we conclude, I'm just going to hand over to Kate, who is the chair of CACM. Uh, to talk about uh, some training opportunities and also a survey. Yes, so a week ago um, we mentioned the fact that there is an opportunity for CACN to secure some funding um, to help us do more training and, uh, training and development opportunities for yourselves. Um, um, but we needed a bit more information from you, a bit more specific information. So we put out a one question survey and we've had like 90 responses in the last week since we spoke. So that is fantastic. The survey link is in chat. If you haven't filled it in yet, please answer the question. We just wanna know what training and development do you need? Um, and on the subject of training and development, we have a few more places left uh, at the fundraising training called Making Sense of Fund Funding Bids, Making Sense of Funding Bids, which is happening at the Beacon the Coro and Reghead. The uh, link is in the chat and the session at Reghead is actually full, but there is particularly space at uh, the Beacon. So please have a look and take up those opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I think I might call it Reg Reghead. Reghead <laughs> from now onwards. It's a great way of saying Reghead. Reghead. Right. <laughs> so the space is still at the Beacon and at the Coro. Reghead, I think, is full. It is. Um, next week, we're going to hear from Rachel Ashton from Theatre Factory. Uh, we're going to hear all about Blue Jam, what's going on there. And also an update on the Helping Hands project, which I know is making real progress now. And look out for a new episode of the podcast coming out next week, all about rural touring. Uh, which should be out Monday or Tuesday, something like that. Thank you very much to Steve, to Gabby, to Roshin and to Ellie for this morning. It's been fascinating as ever. Thank you for your time this morning as well. Um, good to see you all. Enjoy Eurovision if you care and catch you all again next week. Have a nice weekend, everybody. <laughs>